chapters 4 and 5 in the book of Revelation portray to us the throne room of heaven with the emphasis in chapter 4 upon God who is occupying the throne and the emphasis in chapter 5 upon Jesus Christ who is seated at the right hand of God. We uh, have covered all of chapter 4 and most of chapter 5. We need to finish that portion tonight and then get on into chapter 6. We begin our study tonight in chapter 5 of Revelation with verse 9, which indicates they sang a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the book and to break its seals, for you were slain and purchased for God with your blood, men from every tribe, tongue, people, and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. Question number one, where does the idea of a new song come from? You read about this back in the book of Psalms, Psalm 33 and verse 3, which contains these words, sing to him a new song. Play skillfully with a joyful, uh, with a shout of joy. Here we are seeing that there's a song that has been uh, presented to the Father for the goodness of creation, and Jesus is being praised in song for the work of his redemption, or some people might say recreation. We become new people in Christ the moment we become Christians. Question number two, what is acknowledged in this new song? Obviously, the song's primary emphasis is directed to Christ, and they're singing, Worthy is the Lamb, because Jesus, the Lamb of God, stepped forward to break the seals so that the contents of this scroll might be revealed to all the rest of us. And they recognize that that which qualified him to do so is the fact that he was the only perfect Lamb of God, the only perfect person to ever walk upon this earth. He assumed our sins in his death he who knew no sin was made to be sin on our behalf. This is a recognition of what Christ has done for us that makes possible the salvation of everybody upon the face of the earth. And this is something to sing about and to sing with great joy. Number three, are Christians kings? The reason I ask this question is because in the King James Version, of this passage in the book of Revelation it refers to Christians as being kings. It occurs to me that in a kingdom, there's only room for one king. Yes, we are the uh, members of the kingdom, and we do reign with Christ, but we are who we are, not because of what we are, but who we are related to. And we are related to the Lord Jesus Christ. We're described as his body, we're described as his bride, we're described as his church. Uh, we then are the ones that are sharing in that reign because of our submission to the will of God. And because we walk in the steps of Jesus, we then are a part of his body that is reigning over this kingdom by the doing of his will and setting the proper example for others. The next question asks the question, are we priests? And the answer is yes, we are priests. We are not kings, we are a kingdom. We are subjects of the king, but we are priests. Interesting, uh, in the scripture, uh, two very important people that we meet uh, several places, both in the Old and the New Testament, are the prophets and the priests. The prophet represents God to man. That's why he's called a prophet. A prophet is somebody who speaks for somebody else. And so the prophets in the Bible are those God has given information that through them they might share it with us. So all the writers of the 66 books of the Bible are the ones who are inspired by the Holy Spirit and they serve a prophetic function. So the whole Bible is uh, the prophetic word of God. In other words, it's the word that God wants us to hear and understand. And thus he's made it known through a group who we refer to as prophets. Priests, on the other hand, represent man to God. A priest, then, is one who offers a sacrifice to please God 
and to honor God through obedience in the sacrificial system. In uh, Peter's writings, he refers to us as being a part of the royal priesthood. We are a holy nation. We are the people of God. We are the ones through whom God wants the world to know what it's like to be a member of his kingdom. So as priests, we do not present animal sacrifices that they did in the Old Testament days. We present our bodies as living sacrifices. And we do this by not being conformed to this world, but by being transformed by the renewing of our minds that we might prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So our bodies being the temple of the Holy Spirit and our bodies being the means whereby we live as living sacrifices, people then see in our behavior the kind of behavior that the rest of the world should imitate because we are simply imitating what Christ has already exemplified for us. Question number five, how many designations are given to those for whom the blood of Christ was shed? Four different designations. Now this is nothing new to us. Remember, the whole book of Revelation is presented to us in the form of a drama with many symbols and signs and the numbers in the book of Revelation are obviously symbols or signs of some important truth. The number four is the earth number. And so to describe all the peoples on this earth, he uses the term tribe, tongue, people, and nation. This is consistent all the way through the book of Revelation. So what we've already read, what we are yet going to read, every time you focus upon the number four, that is reminding you that we're talking about the earth and the people that live upon this earth as we understand it. Number six, what does John learn from the new song that involves the kingdom and priests? The thing that he learns about those of us who are part of his kingdom and those of us who are his priests are reigning with Christ upon this earth. Now, some people may misunderstand this because there's always the temptation to understand spiritual truth with physical reality. And some people think, okay, if we're going to reign upon this earth, we're going to be like a king sitting upon the throne someplace and having all the people in subjection to us. That's not the way it is in God's kingdom. Jesus, when he stood before Pilate, said, my kingdom is not of this world. So we are a part of a spiritual kingdom. Do we reign in that kingdom? That's what he says that we do. Now, how do we reign in his kingdom? We reign by doing his will. We reign by being an example of what a Christian ought to be. We reign by giving Christ the preeminence in our lives. We reign by putting first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And with our faith in him, we know that he'll provide and meet all of our needs along the way. Now, let me uh, illustrate this, probably with the kind of illustration that you've heard before. Uh, this is personal with me, but I think it can be personal and probably is with you too. For a number of years, I, uh, for 11 years actually in my life, I worked as a volunteer fireman. Now, during this time, I was a preacher, but I was in a community, small community, where they had volunteers make up the fire department. On one Saturday, we were down at the fire station and we were cleaning up the fire truck because of a previous run that had kind of dirtied it up. So we used that day to kind of get everything cleaned up and the hose is in good shape again for the next call. In the process of uh, cleaning up the truck, one of the fellows, a uh, fellow volunteer fire department, was standing close to me and he injured his hand. And immediately he began to say something and caught himself just in the nick of time and didn't say it. And he looked at me and he said, it's a good thing you were standing there. <laughs> and I responded and said, yeah, and that's the reason I'm standing here. <laughs> I want to help a guy like you. I don't want you to say those bad words. Uh, now, I, my experience may be different than a lot of yours because most of my experiences are with people that know who I am. And knowing that I'm a preacher, they're pretty well guarded. And uh, they try to hide things from me. I called on a member of the church one day when he was drinking and the boy he didn't want to see me and he couldn't hide that drink fast enough but he sure tried uh, what was I doing I was reigning with Christ what was I doing making him feel at ease 
just simply by my presence. Well, who am I? I'm no different than the rest of you. We're just Christians. But there's some things Christians don't do <coughs> that the rest of the world does, and they don't bat an eye. But uh, he felt guilty, and he should have, because he knew better. But he had not really turned away completely from the ways of this world. But uh, our presence ought to really say something to other people. I think I may have told some of you this, that I was asked to perform a wedding one time, and uh, the daughter of the couple was a member of the church that I was serving, and they were going to have a banquet involving all the people that were going to be involved in the wedding the night before the wedding took place, uh, after the rehearsal, kind of a rehearsal dinner. And the uh, mother of the bride said, uh, you are certainly invited, and I'd love for you to come, but please do not feel obligated to come, because we cannot promise you good behavior on the part of some of the people that are going to be there. And I said, well, I'm glad you told me that. Uh, I just have one request. When we sit down at the table, put me right across the table from those people that are going to embarrass me. And he said, well, I think we can arrange that. And they did. Ha, ha, I tell you, I didn't hear one bad word, and I didn't hear one bad thought, uh, and I had a wonderful time. I think they had a miserable time. Uh, but I think that they were able to digest the food. It was just the company they had to keep the opposite side of the table. Was I reigning with Christ? Yes, I think I was. That's the reason I wanted to be there. I'm not, I don't want to be obnoxious. I tried to be as honest as I could, engage them in conversation, ask them about the kind of work they did, showed interest in their hobbies and uh, their background, and just established a good rapport. But uh, the fact that I was there, of course, they called on me to lead in prayer. And I'm sure these people sitting across the table from me Ordinarily, do not offer a prayer of thanksgiving before they eat, but Christians do. And uh, so I think that uh, we need to recognize that sometimes our best witness does not involve saying a word. Sometimes it just involves them being a decent person. Sometimes it just means you don't laugh at things that others laugh at because it's really not funny. And sometimes it means you just simply say, sorry, I, I, I really can't go there. And you don't stand in their way of going where they're going, but you know as a Christian, I don't really belong there. And so just in a quiet, nice way, we reign with Christ. Now that's a spiritual kingdom. This is not the kind of a kingdom where you beat people over the head with a whip or with a baseball bat. This is the kind of kingdom that is demonstrated in our king. What did Jesus do? He went about doing good. Now did he shy away from sinners? Oh no. He went into their house and ate with them. I figured if Jesus can do that, we ought to do it too. And Jesus helped other people, whatever their needs might have been. Never turned people away. Sometimes the people turned away from him, but he fed them when they were hungry. And then he wanted to feed them even more with spiritual food. They decided, no, it's just this physical food that we like and we don't want the other stuff. So they went away. And Jesus said, that's your privilege. We don't push ourselves on people. Christ doesn't push himself. Every man is born with the freedom of choice. And we are who we choose to be. Now, are there consequences in our choices? Oh, yes, there are. And we are Christians know that these are going to be eternal consequences. So I want to spend my eternity in a place that's called heaven. And I certainly don't want to spend eternity in a place that they call hell a place of torment and of punishment, a place that's described as outer darkness. Imagine being in total darkness for eternity. Imagine being a place that's called a furnace of fire. Imagine being in a place where all the people are weeping and wailing and gnashing their teeth. What would that be like for an eternity? I, don't, I can't comprehend that. But I can understand it well enough to know I don't want to be there. All right, I've taken enough time. I hope you understand what is meant here by the fact that, yes, we are priests of God, and yes, we are subjects of the king, and in that
position, each one of us is reigning with Christ. We are helping people to understand His kingdom, and hopefully, by our representation of that kingdom, they will choose to want to be a part of that kingdom too. Because this is a kingdom, unlike the kingdoms of the world, the rise and fall. Every one of them will ultimately fall. But this one never will. It'll stand firm for all eternity. All right, let's move on now to verses uh, 11 through 12. Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels around the throne and the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. Now, if you were counting, you counted seven words that are a part of this uh, song of praise that is being sung in honor of the Lord Jesus Christ and what he's done for us to become our Savior and our Lord. Question number one, was John able to determine the number of angels, living creatures, and elders around the throne? No, no he wasn't. So uh, he couldn't give a precise count, but he was very much aware of the fact Wow, this is a great number. And that would be the angels. That nobody knows how many of them there are. It uh, certainly made an impression upon John, not only by what he saw, but also what he heard. Because they're praising God. So he's hearing their praise to God, but he's also seeing how huge this number is. Now, why is that important? Do you remember Jesus in his public ministry actually uh, in the Sermon on the Mount indicated that the way that leads to eternal life in reality is going to be walked only by a few. That's comparatively speaking. And the way that is a broad way, the broad way seems to suggest to me you can do just about anything you want to do, but the broad way leads to condemnation, eternal destruction. Now, though that is true, don't misunderstand the meaning of the word few. A few does not mean that there's just going to be a couple of dozen people there. Or even that there's going to be just 144,000. 144,000 is a symbolic number to indicate there's going to be a great number of people. Folks, there are a lot of Christians around the world. And think how long the world's been in existence. And think how long the church has been in existence. Here we are in the 21st century and the church is still very much alive and the church has been growing in every cent century since it began in the first century. So there are a few, but the few is understood in light of the total world's population. Now, in today's world, in our own country, would the non-Christians outnumber the Christians? Well, yes, they would. Does that surprise us? Not really. Does that concern us? Oh, yes, it does. It ought always to concern us. Now, when Jesus was here upon the earth, he dealt with a few people. And he left a few people in charge of a worldwide responsibility. Did he have confidence in these few? Yes, he did. Was he ever disappointed in these few that he trusted? Oh, time and again. Do you think he's ever been disappointed in us? I'm sure he's been disappointed in me many, many times. But the fact remains, he is really counting on us. He is really trusting in us. He's really encouraging us through the Word to get this good news around the world. And so what do we do? Well, here is a congregation. You are supporting missions in Japan, in the Dominican Republic, and other places, as well as being interested in trying to reach people in your own community who may not yet be Christians. Are we doing the will of the Lord? Yes. So we just quietly go about our work does this make the front page of the local newspaper? Probably not. Will people in the community talk about it very much? Probably not. And yet, behind the scenes, work is going on every day by a great number of people, some we know and some we'll never know, until we get to heaven. But the work is continuing. So um, we need to recognize that uh, here before the throne, there's a great crowd that are witnessing and uh, praising the Lord Jesus Christ uh, 
number of angels beyond that which we're able to count, but all of creation is included in this. All the people of God are involved in this. And they're singing what we know to be a sevenfold doxology. Now, seven is a sacred number, and that's the number that is also symbolizing completeness. So there, the number itself indicates we know who we're singing to. We know who we're praising. We're praising the Lord Jesus Christ as well as God by whose right side he is standing and seated as he's there in this throne room. Now the final verse of this chapter, verse 13, every created thing which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all things in them, I heard saying, to him who sits on the throne, that's God, and to the Lamb, that's the Lord Jesus Christ, be blessing and honor and glory and dominion. Oh, wait a minute, that's only four. But who's singing this? And the four living creatures kept saying, Amen. And the elders fell down and worship. So four is the number of the earth. And as God's people on the earth are, and all of creation is hearing and visualizing what's happening there in the throne room and recognizing what happened at Calvary and on the cross when Jesus died for us. And they're just saying, Amen, Amen, Amen. <coughs> amen simply means so be it, or I agree with you, or this is certainly true. All that's involved in that word, Amen. And so the number four indicates that uh, God and the Lamb are being praised by everything that they have created. And by the way, Jesus is just as much involved in creation as was God the Father. Colossians chapter 1, verses 16 through 19 will make it very clear that Jesus is the creator. Uh, Jesus was able to say, He who has seen me has seen the Father. Remember how Jesus is introduced in the Gospel of John? In the beginning was the Word. The Word is with God. The Word was God. And down in verse 16, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. So is the Word God? Yes. Is the Word the Lord Jesus Christ? Yes. Why did He become flesh? Because it's a lot easier for us to understand something that we see than it is something we just uh, hear about. And so God is a spirit, but God as a spirit identified himself in the person of Christ, his son, in a physical body so that we could see demonstrated what it's like to be a child of God. Uh, number six, well, let me make sure I've covered all these others. With what words did every created thing Praise God and the Lamb of God. Well, they're giving blessing, honor, glory, and dominion forever and ever. That's the word of this doxology. Does the fourfold doxology fit the symbolism of the number four on the earth? Yes, it does, because that's creation's number. So no part of creation is left out. All the heavens and the earth, everything praises God. Sometimes we're not aware of it as we should be, but it's very clear that that happens. Did both God and Christ share in creating the world? I've already answered that for you and giving you the scripture reference. By the way, I didn't say again tonight what I've told you in the past. In Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The word God is plural. That includes the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. So they're all there in a part of the creation. Do God and Jesus share in governing the universe? Obviously, they do. Why is amen repeated? because of, of their excitement, their joy, and their approval, and they want to make sure that they're not misunderstood. We agree, we agree, we agree. This is something the whole world needs to know. Now the final question of this chapter, uh, have chapters four and five of Revelation provided the reader with the knowledge and understanding necessary to evaluate properly the events of history? Uh, obviously, I think that's their purpose. Now, what is in history that we need to understand. Primarily, we need to understand that from day one to the final day that the world and, and the universe is existing, throughout this entire period of time, God has never vacated his throne. And everything that has happened and is now happening and will yet happen, happens 
with the knowledge of God and with the permission of God and under the control of God. Do a lot of things bad happen? Oh, yes, they do. But is God still in charge? Yes, he is. Does God ever use bad things to make something good come from them? What happened at Calvary? Would you call it good to say that the men were right who had Jesus crucified when he was not guilty of anything wrong? I say that's a pretty bad thing. But God turned it into something very good. Ask Joseph. He had a lot of experiences. He was lied against. He was sold by his own brothers. He was placed in prison and forgotten. Uh, all this began when he was a teenager 20 years later. He had been exalted next to the Pharaoh himself. And during the, year of, the years of famine, because he had been blessed of God to know what was going to happen and had made preparations in Egypt to lay up in store for those years of famine, his family outside of Egypt learned about the fact that there's food in Egypt. They came down there to get food. He gave them food. Did they know who he was? No. Did they come back a second time? Yes. Did they still know who he was? Not yet. But during the second visit that they were back there, he said, uh, I'm your brother. They were shocked. Now he'd been speaking through an interpreter and giving the impression that he didn't understand what they were saying. He understood every word. And then invited them the third time, they came back, 75 of them, and they remained there. And that's where the Jewish nation really grew to be a great nation. And later on, under the leadership of Moses, were led to their freedom and to the promised land. But uh, God was working in Joseph's life in all those unfortunate circumstances when his brothers misunderstood him, when he was mistreated, when he lost a job because he was willing to stand up for what was morally right and pure. God never forgot him. And that's true of so many, many people. And we need to recognize that. So, these two chapters are really significant because they emphasize that God is on his throne and everything that we read from here on out is going to be centered back down toward the earth from heaven's perspective. So John in the spirit, in his mind, in his thoughts, is in the very presence of God, in the very presence of God's glory, in the presence of Christ. And from that heavenly vantage point, God is going to say, now John, while you're up here, look down upon the earth, will you? Now what happens when you ascend into an airplane and look down at the earth, on the earth? Do not things appear to be much smaller than they really are? It's not the fact that they have changed their size. Our perspective has changed. And so it is in heaven. Now, in chapter 6, this is where opinions of men really begin to run kind of wild. And folks, I don't want to leave you with the impression that I have all the answers. I don't. I'm going to share with you as best I can what I believe that the book of Revelation is saying to us. But don't think that I am saying the final word. You think for yourself. I'm just going to ask you to think with me to try to understand what is the message he's delivering here. Now remember, here's a scroll and it's bound by seven seals. Now, they're each one going to be broken separately. And Jesus is the one now who's already proved that he can step up to the throne and break that first seal. That'd be like breaking a thread, a thread wrapped around here, tied in a knot. They had a piece of wax in that knot and the signet ring had put the seal on that. Well, Jesus is the one that's qualified to go up there and break that thread. So now we can unroll the first part of the scroll. So what are we going to see? as the scroll is unrolled in chapter 6. We're going to see six of the seals broken. Number one, we're going to see a white horse. Number two, we're going to see a red horse. Number three, we're going to see a black horse. And number four, we're going to see an ashen or a pale horse. Number five, we're going to see Christians dead with their blood being shed at the base of the altar that was located in front of the tabernacle. 
the altar of sacrifice. The altar in the Old Testament where animals were sacrificed to God. And then plague uh, seal number six, rather, is going to show us a picture of the people who are responsible for what we saw in the fifth picture. The fifth picture is a picture of Christian martyrs. They've died for their faith. Six is a picture of those who are responsible for their death. And it's really a sad picture because it's a preview of what hell is going to be like. Now, before we ever break that last seal, the seventh seal, we're going to digress in chapter seven. And that's going to be kind of an interlude chapter. And that chapter is going to give us a word of encouragement. And that word of encouragement is going to come in the form of two pictures. The first picture is a picture of all Christians living upon this earth. It's going to be a beautiful picture, by the way. The second picture, beginning with verse 9 to the end of the chapter, is going to show us a picture of all those who have died before us who are Christians. And when you read the second half of the book of Revelation, chapter 7, it almost sounds like you're reading the last two chapters. Because it's a picture of heaven. It's a picture where there's no more sickness, no more dying, no more darkness. Everything's beautiful. Everything is lovely. These people are with God. So that means that what Paul has been saying in his letters, to be absent of the body is to be present with the Lord. Or to put it another way with Paul, he said, for to me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. I'm even better off after death. Because at death you don't cease to exist. At death you go to be with the Lord. Now, are those who have died in the faith with the Lord? Absolutely. So are we. Where two or three of us are gathered together, there the Lord is with us. Always. So the Lord is with us tonight. And He speaks to us through His Word. And we show appreciation for His presence by the attention we give to His Word. But those who have died in Christ, they're with the Lord too. But not with the body. That body that they're going to receive is going to be given to them at the same time we're going to be given a new body. We're going to leave this body here upon the earth. It's going to go back to the element from whence it came. But at the time of Christ's resurrection, the Bible says in the fourth chapter of 1 Thessalonians, the dead in Christ are going to rise first, then we who are alive and remain are going to be caught up with them, and we're going to be forever with the Lord. So that's the return of Christ. That's the time that the resurrection is going to take place. Now I want to add, as I've added before, because I want us to, to see the total picture, will the wicked participate in the resurrection? Oh yes, they will. But it's not a pretty picture. You read about this in the fifth chapter of John, beginning with, oh, somewhere around about verse 24, down through verses 28 and 29. For some, the resurrection is going to be a resurrection to life eternal. That's Christians. For others, it's going to be a resurrection unto condemnation because they're not Christians. And so, everybody's going to face an eternity. Nobody's going to be able to avoid it. These people that entertain the thoughts, well, I'll just die and that's going to be it. That's not true. The whole 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians, Paul wrote to the church in Corinth because they were plagued by people around them. Their great philosophers were saying, death is the end of it. And Paul's saying, no, that's not true. We are going to live. Everybody is going to expend an eternity somewhere. But this life becomes very, very important to all of us because here's where we determine where that eternity is going to be. All right, with that much of a glimpse of what we're about to face, let's look then at the first seal uh, that is going to be broken. Let me rehearse once again these four horses. These first four seals are very much alike. The difference is the fact that they're all horses, but they're different colors. That's the main difference. Another main difference is the difference in the one that's riding it. Another main difference is in what they have with them when they're riding these white horses. Now remember, the horse was the instrument of war. White is the purity color. So the first one is white. The second one is red. That's the color of blood. That probably represents war. The third, third one is black. That represents death. That's going to be very clear. And then the fourth one is going to be ashen. That's going to be represented with famine. Now, do these things literally happen? Yes, they do. Is that what Revelation is saying? Not primarily. Remember, we're engaged in a spiritual battle. 
We wrestle not against flesh and blood. That's in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12. People are not our enemy. Evil forces, wicked powers, satanic presence, that's our enemy. Sin is our enemy. Evil, wrong is our enemy. It's a spiritual battle. The lie is our enemy. The truth is our weapon. Righteousness is the breastplate that protects us. So, in verse uh, 1, Then I saw the, when the Lamb uh, broke one of the seven seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures saying with the voice of thunder, Come. I looked, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he went out conquering and to conquer. Now, folks, will you do something? Will you imagine that you're seated in an auditorium, and the curtains open, and what do you see? The landscape, that's all. And before anything even moves on the stage, this is a stage of history. You hear a voice. It's a loud voice. This first voice sounds like the roar of a lion, because he was the first creature. Come! And directly you see, off stage, a white horse with a rider crossing the stage of history and then going off to the other side. And when that horse is exited on the other side, there's going to be a moment of silence and you'll hear another voice, a different voice, that's going to issue the same command, come! And this time you're going to see a red horse. You're going to see the blood that is shed because of the conquest that took place in the first horse. And after that horse exits, then a third creature is going to other the command come once again. And this time it's going to be the uh, black horse. And then the last one's going to be the ashen horse. So we have a conquest and war and death and famine. Or famine and death. We have these four things. Do these things happen again and again throughout history? Well, they're happening today. Now, what is God doing? God's using what we understand in history. We know what a horse is. If you read the Bible, you know that the horse, in the Bible times, was their instrument of warfare. They used bow and arrows while they were riding those horses back in, in Bible days. But people were constantly trying to conquer other areas. But in addition to that, you try to conquer something, and are you going to get resistance? Yeah. Okay, just entertain the fact that we are in the battle. We are. That's why one of the songs we sometimes sing is Onward Christian Soldiers. Marching as to war. What are we doing? We're battling against sin. We're battling against the devil's lie. We're battling with a sword of truth. Do you know what truth is? Do you know what the future holds for you? Do you know what God has in store for you if you'll simply follow Him? We've come to tell you that. What are we doing? <clears throat> Trying to conquer the world through our Christian witness. Are we ever met with opposition? Oh, yes, many times. Do people ever die because of it? Oh, yes. I understand that there's more killing of Christians in this century than any century previous to this one in history. There's war, there's death, there's famine. What kind of famine? A lot of people have never even heard of the Bible. They have no idea of what the truth of God is. Nobody's ever told them. And that's our job. All right, let's look at the questions here. Number one, is God on His throne? Is God on His throne when the action described in Revelation takes place? The answer is yes. He never vacates the throne. He's always in control. Number two, who broke one of the seven seals? Well, this is the Lamb of God. He's the one that's been already praised as being worthy because He died for our sins. And he proved the greater power of God through his resurrection. Number three, what is significant with the word come? The significance of this is the fact that it was given with a voice of thunder. Is this message clear? Yes, it is. And this is meaning that it's so loud that there's no way that anybody's going to escape this order to come. Now, who issues the word to come? One of the four living creatures. That's exactly right. Uh, number five, to whom is the order come given? 
Well, this first time is given to the rider of the white horse. Number six, what is symbolized with the white horse? Well, I think that the conquest is a simple answer. Now, are we talking about the general picture of conquest that has characterized the history of the world? Maybe. But in light of the fact that over the 19th chapter of this same book, we're going to meet the rider of the white horse one more time. And this time, it's going to be very clear that the rider of the white horse is Christ. So is he the one that's riding this horse? I think that he is. I think that uh, he is the one. Now, again, I don't want to force my opinion on you, but I, it just seems to me that uh, we are Christian soldiers. We are battling against sin. And Christ is our leader. And so he is leading us forth into world conquest. That's why he said, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. He that doesn't believe is going to be condemned. So this is our charge from the one. Now white is the color of victory, the color of purity. Number seven, how is the rider of the white horse described? Well, he had a bow and a crown was given to him. Now this crown is not a royal crown. It's a victor's crown. He had a bow. Why that instrument? Well, that was the instrument used in Bible days in fighting. In fact, in the first century, the most famous bowmen or archers in the world were the Parthians, the enemies to the east of the Roman Empire. And it's said that when uh, a Parthian placed the arrow against the string and was pulled back and released, that it always hit its target. This is the kind of picture that I want you to see because I think that picture would have immediately come to the minds of the people in the first century that first read this book. I think, hey, he's talking about something we know much about because of the Parthians and their skill in this area. Now, number eight, what was the rider of the white horse intending to do? What he's intending to conquer, that's what he's doing. He's moving out in battle and his goal is to conquer the world. Does he conquer the world? Well, not necessarily, but that's his goal. Is he going to run into snags along the way? Yes, he will. So we begin as Christian soldiers fighting for him. Are we going to run into opposition along the way? Yeah, we will. And we're going to see that with the other horses that are going to come. But uh, he is intending to conquer. Now, what was the first creature like? Back in chapter 4, verse 7, where we first were introduced to these creatures, the first one was like a lion like a lion. Isn't that interesting? Particularly if you believe now that the rider of the white horse is Christ because Christ is identified as the root of David and the lion of the tribe of Judah. So this fits. Let's pray. Father in heaven, you visualize to us in your word some pictures we want to understand correctly. Help us to entertain the possibilities that others may have so that we might be able to sift and examine each one in light of your word to make sure that this really fits the picture. And God, I pray that through our study of the book of Revelation, you'll put a big stumbling block in our way to re keep us from reaching wrong conclusions. We want to recognize that we are privileged to be a part of your kingdom which is not a world kingdom, a spiritual kingdom. And your battle is not a battle that men fight with physical forces, but it's a spiritual battle and is fought with the sword of the spirit. And our enemy's weapon is the lie and false propaganda. Help us to stand firmly for the truth and steadfastly against the lie. And may we by the experiences of others and by our own experiences and the experiences of history, realize that ultimately the lie is proved to be a lie. And truth always has stood on its own two feet. And when the final day is over, as you've helped us to understand in your word, truth will prevail. So that what happened in the Garden of Eden so long ago, when the devil told a lie, and man foolishly believed a lie. What trouble we've had ever since. 
May we be on the side of truth, on the side of victory, on the side of blessed assurance. Encourage us then throughout our study to be faithful to you as soldiers of the Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.